Hi there, it's Kathy Gates and Melissa Hines from the Institute for Pelvic Health. And you're watching Demystifying the Pelvic Floor, weekly videos providing real and simplified pelvic floor education for real clinical situations. We've got you covered. And in this video, we're going to go over the Q-tip test and how you can utilize it in your pelvic exams. So here we have a nice image of a vestibule, and this is the area that you are focusing on when you're using the Q-tip to test for um, any pelvic floor muscle hypertonicity issues. Kathy, and do remember, you use this in the clinic? I do. And I was just going to say, remember, if you don't have a Q-tip, you can use your index finger. It's completely, completely fine. And let's just take a moment and really look at the vestibule. Because as Melissa said, that's where we're looking to see if there are any areas of tenderness. And Melissa, if you go through to the next slide, just for a moment, you can utilize your pelvic clock when you're thinking about the vestibule. As you see here, we have the pelvic clock labeled for you actually on the pelvic floor uh, muscles and on the joints and bones that give you the anchors for where the muscles connect to. But if you just shortened that pelvic clock, you'd have 12 o'clock up by the clitoris, you'd have six o'clock at the pos posterior foreshut, and then three and nine would be on either side of the labia. So when you are doing the Q-tip test, you want to make sure that you're doing it a few times um, because mm -hmm. often the patient may say to you something's tender just because they feel like that's the right thing to say. So you just want to make sure that you get an accurate read. So you would start with the Q-tip up at 12 o'clock and then just gently work your way down, making sure that you're right on that vestibular tissue. Um, generally, the findings for the Q-tip tests are if there's any tenderness or hypersensitivity along that posterior foreshet or between, what would you say, Kathy, like between four and eight, four and really? eight, I think. Yeah. Then yeah, there's a then pelvic you're... floor muscle component and it's almost always a tightness issue that you're working okay. with. So this tells you is a great assessment tool because it will tell you a lot. And then Kathy, what mm -hmm. if it's like in that anterior vestibule, what does that signify? Uh, if it's in the anterior vestibule, that's a great question. So probably we're thinking more neuroproliferative, maybe, um, maybe congenital, not quite sure. But I think the big thing is that we're not thinking pelvic floor hypertonicity as much. And so that it's most likely not a pelvic floor muscle underlying ideology. Um, so neuroproliferative is just that there might be an increased amount of um, like hypersensitive nerve endings in the area. And then some women also have what's called congenital vestibulodynia. And that comes from that connection of like when the urogenital sinus is developing, actually, I believe in embryonic fetal development, right, Melissa? Mm -hmm. I think if these patients will have extreme tenderness at the umbilicus, all the time. Like if you touch it, you'll really elicit a lot of pain. So just something else to think about. If you notice tenderness on the anterior part of the vestibule, it's worth asking your patient, can I palpate your, bel your belly button? And a lot of times they'll say, oh, you know, you don't say anything. You know, you don't make any connections for them. But a lot of times patients will say to you, mm -hmm. huh, you know, my belly button is always tender when somebody touches it. So I think that's just important. Yeah. The key takeaway here is it's a quick assessment tool to determine if someone could potentially have pelvic floor muscle hypertonicity. And when we say tender, it's, you know, more tender than just like, oh yeah, I feel that that's like a little tender, not bad. It's, you know, pretty hypersensitive. And then, you know, that a lot of those muscles attach into that area and it could be a pelvic floor muscle component. And that's a wrap. Did you like this video? If so, hit like and subscribe. Please share with your colleagues and comment below to let us know your biggest challenges in taking care of patients with pelvic floor dysfunction. And subscribe to our email list at instituteforpelvichealth.com to get your free guide, Four Tips for Managing Your Challenging Pelvic Exam. And be sure to find us on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn, where we'll post more pelvic health tips. 
And we're thrilled to announce that we have launched Beyond the Kegel, the only interdisciplinary AANP accredited online course for NPs and CNMs. Enrollment is open. <laughs> so Beyond the Kegel is six modules packed with practical information that we most likely didn't get in our training. Plus, you'll get our digital clinician resource binder, which includes templates, patient education handouts in English and in Spanish, hands-on demos, everything you need to confidently help your patients with pelvic floor dysfunction. By simplifying the pelvic floor, we'll improve patient outcomes and your provider experience. Thanks for watching and spreading the word. Now let's revolutionize pelvic health. We'll see you soon.